Good evening. evening. Welcome to worship as we observe the suffering of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Tonight's theme is testimony. We begin with the opening service sermon with an introduction. The Almighty grant the Almighty grant us a quiet night and peace at the last. Amen. It is good to give thanks to the Lord. To herald your love in the morning. We continue with the singing of the opening hymn 393, Savior when in dust to you.
Please stand. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Let us confess our sins in the presence of God and one another. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you in our thoughts, in our words, in our deeds, and all that we have not done. Forgive us in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Deliver and restore us that we may rest in peace. By the mercy of God, we are redeemed by Jesus Christ, and in him we are forgiven. Let us rest in his peace until the rising of the sun, when we shall serve him in newness of life. Amen. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Keep me as the apple of your eye. Hide me in the shadow of your wings. In righteousness I shall see you. When I awake, your presence will give me joy. Be present, <clears throat> O merciful God, and protect us through the silent hours of this night, so that we who are wearied by the ch changes and chances of this fleeting world may rest in your eternal changelessness. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please be seated for the psalm.
we continue with the Passion history, which we shall read responsibly. Now the Passover of the Festival of Unleavened Bread, we're only two days away, and the chief priests and the teachers of the law were scheming to arrest Jesus secretly and kill him. But not during the festival, they said, or the people may riot. Some of those present were saying indignantly to one another, why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for more than a year's wages and the money given to the poor, and they rebuked her harshly. Leave her alone, she says. Why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful thing, but I always have with you and you will, can help them at any time you want, but you will not always have me. She did what she could. She poured perfume on my body beforehand to prepare for my burial. Truly, I tell you, wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went to the chief priests to betray Jesus to them. They were delighted to hear this and promised to give him money. So he watched for an opportunity to hand him over. On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, when it was customary to sacrifice the spouse of the lamb, Jesus' disciples asked him, where do you want us to go and make preparations for you to eat the Passover? So he said, The disciples left and went to the city and found things just as Jesus had told them. So they prepared the Passover. When evening came, Jesus arrived with the twelve. While they were reclining at the table eating, he said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They were sad. It is one of the twelve, he replied, one who dips bread into the bowl with me. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him, but woe to the man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. Truly I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the day when we drink it anew in the kingdom of God. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. We continue with the hymn, 408, he stood before the court.
Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God, our Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let us pray. O oh, dearest Jesus, what law have you broken that such a sharp sentence on, should on you be spoken? Of what great crime have you to make confession? What dark transgression? Amen. We hear God's word from the first section of our lesson this evening, beginning with verse 57 of the Gospel according to Matthew in verse 57, chapter 26. And we all read up to verse 67. Those who arrested Jesus took him to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the teachers of the law and the elders had assembly, and assembled. But Peter followed him at a distance right up to the courtyard of the high priest. He entered and sat down with the guards to see the outcome. The chief priest and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for false evidence against Jesus so that they could put him to death, but they did not find any. Though many false witnesses came forward, finally two came forward and declared, this fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. Then the high priest stood up and said to Jesus, Are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent. The high priest said to him, I charge you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. You have said so, Jesus replied. But I say to all of you, from now on, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, He has spoken blasphemy. Why do we need any more witnesses? Look now, you have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? He is worthy of death, they answered. So they spit in his face and struck him with their fists. Others slapped him and said, Prophesy to us, Messiah, who hit you. This is the word of our Lord. In Christ Jesus, dear fellow sinners and dear fellow redeemed. Years ago, I saw a bumper sticker. Oh my goodness, I think it's like 50 years ago. And it made a deep impression on me. The bumper sticker said, if you were on trial for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Seems like kind, kind of a long sentence. Maybe it was a little shorter, but that's basically what it said. Would there be enough evidence to convict you? Jesus was up on this charge, or a similar charge. They wanted him to be punished, punished for who he was and what he had done. God has been on trial ever since, you might say, this world was created, or maybe even before then. It all depends when Satan rebelled against God, because that was way back. And he tried to overthrow God, but fortunately he failed. But ever since then, God is also on trial. And whenever something bad happens in this world, you know one of these shootings, wherever, where you have a war, some kind of catastrophe, an earthquake, whatever, where many people die, all these horrible wars going on all the time. Where is God and why does he allow this to happen? Let him answer that. And they said, well, I ask him that question when I get to heaven someday. Or well, people who say that, they probably won't be in heaven to ask him. But the answer is clear. Those things happen because of sin. This trial of Jesus was a sham trial. It was all decided ahead of time what would happen. They had no use for Jesus. They had to get rid of him. But you know who figured out 
what the motive of the Jewish people was, those religious leaders who wanted Jesus dead. Pilate of all people, Pontius Pilate, who was not a Jew, he didn't care for the Jews, he didn't care for their religion. He was appointed to his position by Caesar. And now these people who were stubborn, again acted up, became restless. And he had to quell that. But after listening to a few of the arguments, the Gospels tell us, Pilate realized that it was out of envy that they wanted Jesus convicted. Yes, because of their envy. And we know envy or jealousy is a sin, isn't it? We have a commandment, commandments for that. The epistles also tell us, where you have envy and selfish ambition, you have disorder and every evil practice. It's true. When people are jealous or envious, they are blind. They don't see right or wrong. They just want their own way. They want something. And what they wanted was what Jesus had. Jesus had something they had lost. The Jewish leaders lost the people because things had changed. You know, the Jewish religious leaders were not godly people. They were either Pharisees or Sadducees. The Pharisees believed at least something, but the Sadducees believed in no life after death. And those were the religious leaders. They were Sadducees, didn't even believe that there's life after death. They questioned the existence of God. Now, they were blinded with envy because Jesus was so successful. So, God is on trial. God in Jesus Christ was on trial. And we hear the testimony. We hear the testimony. testimony. It began when John the baptizer came out and preached repentance for the forgiveness of sins. He prepared the way of the Lord. So this was approximately three years before Jesus began his ministry, maybe four years. We don't know how long he worked, but who came to listen to him? Who came to do what he said? They came from all of Galilee, from Judea. That's what it says. All of the people from Galilee and Judea, they were there. They came in droves. And the Pharisees couldn't believe their eyes. They're all going to believe him. And then it'll end for us. Well, Herod did the dirty work. He had the baptizer executed. Or rather, his wife tricked him into doing it. He didn't really want to do it. Now John the Baptist was gone and Jesus was active and people were following him also in droves, especially after the miracle of Lazarus, the raising of Lazarus. Then people, people really followed Jesus more than before. This was amazing, and including all the other miracles of him healing incurable diseases like leprosy, like... Um, you name it, whatever disease it was, the possession by demons. He helped people who couldn't be helped. And that was just too much. People follow him, and we, we will lose our position. That's what Caphas said. And then the Romans will come and take away our place. They were not worried about the souls of the people. They were worried about their jobs. They will get rid of the leaders. You know, the, the, the high priests were actually appointed by the Romans. They answered the Romans, to the Romans. Now they knew their positions in jeopardy. We've got to get rid of this. And by hook or by crook, they said, we will get rid of him. We will set him up. 
we will convict him one way or the other. I guess the trial was a foregone conclusion. It was just a legal formality. Well, it just looked like it was a real thing, but it really wasn't. The sad thing this was, was this trial was in the middle of the night. And the Sanhedrin, which was supposed to hear this, this crime, was not allowed to meet during the day. They couldn't meet because the meeting room was in the temple, and the temple was closed up for nighttime. So they met at Cephas's house. There, they assembled them. And they did it in the dead of night because no one would know about this. Only those who were told. So was it. So, what did Jesus have to say? They had some witnesses come forward, and what did they say? Well, they really didn't agree, agree with each other, and uh, Caiaphas was kind of uh, agitated by this and angry about this, until there were two who came forward and said, this man said, He's going to tear down the temple and rebuild it in three days. Now Caiaphas was so upset. This is unbelievable. He seemed he was, he, he was angry. He tore his clothes. They did that when somebody spoke blasphemy. But it's not that he was upset about it. He was just covering up his joy. He said, he thought, now we have him. And he thought they had him. Unfortunately, they did. Yes, they did. And he asked them, what, what do you think? He asked the people, what do you think? Of course, they had their, their, their own people in the group who led the chair. Crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. Well, we have to do what the people want because the people know everything. But before Pilate, uh, um, what's his name, Caiaphas actually sentenced them, he said, he put him under oath. By the name of the Lord, this is what he said, I charge you under oath by the living God, tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. You have said so, Jesus replied, but I tell you, from now on you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming in the clouds of heaven. Now he was done with Jesus. He's, 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 he made a confession. He's guilty. There's no debate about this anymore. And the people agreed with him. Jesus came into this world as a man. He was like a human being. Jesus was born, as we know, by the Virgin Mary, uh, conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, he was different than any one of us, but he still was a human being. He had to live an entire life that was sinful to cover up our sin. He couldn't sin even once. But you know, Jesus didn't cheat in any way. By, I mean, in cheating, he didn't use his power, his divine power, to stay on the straight and narrow. No, he didn't do that. Uh, Jesus was a miracle person, and yet he still had to be perfect. He couldn't sin. And isn't that one reason why he prayed so much? Because he still needed to act as a human being and not as a divine person? Yes, we know he was God and man at the same time, but he was also a human being, and he had to deal with that. He couldn't sin. He had to be faithful, faithful to himself, faithful to God. You know, we sometimes think some people are, uh, or children are a wunderkind, you know, a miracle child. Jesus, it was a miracle the way he came into this world. 
but it was also a miracle that he didn't sin. And it's not that he performed all kinds of shenanigans to stay on the straight and narrow. He was perfectly perfect. The only time when he used his divine power was when he performed miracles. And the Bible said the purpose of that was so that the people wouldn't know that he was from God. The Old Testament told the people that when, when you, there's a prophet who's a fake prophet, who's not a real prophet, you will know that when he can't perform miracles. Jesus did that, and there were many witnesses who attested to that. How, how did Jesus uh, deal with preparing his sermons? I mean, he preached long sermons. Did he just know all this because he was from heaven? Yeah, he knew all that, but he couldn't cheat. So as a human being, he had to be ready. He had to know what to say and when to say it, and he did. That's why so much praying The testimony of Jesus was true. There were no lies. So now we look at the testimony of Peter. He comes also into play. And there we'll read the second part of this lesson beginning at verse 69. Now Peter was sitting out in the courtyard and a servant girl came to him. You also were with Jesus of Galilee, she said. But he denied it before them all. I don't know what you're talking about, he said. Then he went out to the gateway where another servant girl saw him and said to the people there, this fellow was Jesus, this fellow was with Jesus of Nazareth. He denied it again with an oath. I don't know the man. After a little while, those standing there with, up with two Peter said, surely you are one of them. Your accent gives you away. Then he began to call down curses and he swore to them, I don't know the man. Immediately the rooster crowed. Then Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken. Before the rooster crows you, crows, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept, wept bitterly. The trial was at night. Few people knee, knew about it. Those followers of Jesus who had followed him faithfully knew it. And Peter was one of them. He was there following him at a distance. Peter himself was afraid also at this time. And when he was challenged by the, the bystanders, and at the third time he was challenged, it was a woman who, who said, you have to be one of them because you are from Galilee, your accent betrays you. And then he called curses on himself. Yes. He swore an oath. He swore an oath. Caiaphas made Jesus swear an oath too. Imagine that. Jesus, who's the way, the truth, and the life, is put under oath. Peter was just cursing and then also taking an oath. I swear, I, I don't know the man. I don't know who he is. The man who had earlier that evening said what? I will die with you before I will deny you. And now he, here he was. He wasn't ready. Maybe he would have been ready if he had pray, prayed the way Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane. But they were sleeping instead. They were so tired, so worn out. Watch and pray that you don't fall into temptation, Jesus said. And he says that to us too, because we are also tested, and we will be also tested. And we have been tested. Satan never gives up. And <clears throat> Sometimes the worst test comes on the deathbed. Uh, somebody once said very correctly, uh, death is not child's play. No, it is not child's play. That's true. Believing in Jesus is not ch child's play either. Uh, we can be so critical of Peter, but are we any different? How many times have I not spoken up when I should have? And sometimes I spoke up when I should have been quiet and said nothing. 
and that's because I wasn't prepared. And I didn't work at it hard enough going into a situation which I knew was coming, but maybe just thought I'd wing it. The world still mocks Jesus, doesn't it? The way they did then, they still do it now. I mean, you look around us, there's nothing holy and sacred anymore. They turn things around. Things you wouldn't even talk about are fine now. Nothing is wrong. Everything is gray. Lord, help us to be faithful to you the way you were faithful. And when, we, when, when it happens, when we are unfaithful, we can say the same thing and do the same thing Peter did. He wept. Lord, I have sinned. Lord, have mercy on me. Jesus came into this world for our sin. And when I'm on my deathbed, and I remember some of the things, some of the mistakes and sins of my life, I can rest assured with this truth. He died for all sins. You can tell to anyone who's dying, when they doubt going to heaven, John 3, 16, he who believes has eternal life. Jesus died for all of your sins. That settles it. Well, there's plenty evidence about our sin. But thank goodness what Jesus did. It just covers all of that. He was on trial. And when we are on trial at the great day, he will be there for us. Let us pray. I'll think upon your mercy without ceasing, that earth's vain joys to me no more be pleasing. To do your will shall be my chief endeavor, henceforth forever. Amen. And may the peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, keep our hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We continue with the Apostles' Creed. Please stand. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. We'll continue with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Guide us waking, O Lord, that awake we may watch with Christ in peace. Lord, in peace let your servant now depart according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before, for every people, a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. Guide us when waking, O Lord, that awake we may watch with Christ. Let us praise the Lord. Continue with him, 397, my song of is love unknown.
The almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless and keep us. Amen. We'll say the common pay table prayer before the meal. Come, Lord Jesus, be our guest, and let these gifts of us be blessed. For give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Thank you for asking me to come and um, have a blessed evening.